You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have Paul Haru, PhD. Uh, he's at the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health at McGill University. And we're going to be talking about uh, his work. So, Paul, thanks for coming. Hi, how are you? Good. Yeah, I'm in the rain, but I'm okay otherwise. So, so, so tell me about uh, your research. What does it entail? Well, originally, I was trained uh, as a physicist. And uh, eventually, I became a toxicologist and a cell physiologist, uh, essentially moving from electromagnetic fields in the environment to studying the effects of oxygen on cancer cells, a little bit of what is called oncology, then the effects of magnetic fields on cancer cells, and uh, finally, the metabolic changes there the changes in the, uh, I would say, in the workings of, of, of cells when they are subjected to changing uh, magnetic fields or to changing levels of oxygen. So are you looking just at cells affected by magnetic fields or electric fields or radio frequency or other EMF? Well, you have to understand that the electromagnetic field environment is, uh, in a sense, a very complex place. Uh, we used to have, before we had technology, we used to have natural electromagnetic fields. But since then, and of course light is part of that, but since then we have enriched the uh, environment with new forms of radiation that were not there before. And we have increased the levels of what we call non-natural electromagnetic fields by very, very large factors. What this means is that by changing the environment in this way, there is a natural question that arises. Is the fact that you've changed the environment of, of living systems so much, does it have any consequences? And this is right. essentially the, the answer, the question that was, I, I was trying to answer. So very early on, I, uh, I designed some tests to determine whether what industry was saying that these effects, you know, are neglig negligible, very, very small, or don't exist at all, where I, whether this was true or not. And I was quite surprised to find that uh, uh, the effects are very, very, very clear. How would you characterize the, um, the background levels of magnetism, electro, you know, electricity, uh, RF, et cetera, of a person nowadays versus, um, you know, 100 years ago? Well, a hundred years ago, you had an electric field that was what we would call the fair weather electric field that changed a little bit when there was a storm or something like this. But those are very, very slow fields in the sense that they are almost static fields. And you know about the magnetic field of the Earth. This is what allows us to use a compass. And so these fields have been around us forever. And the other thing that has been around us forever is the radiation that we get from the sun. But somewhere between the very, very slow fields that are generated by the Earth 
and the extremely fast fields generated by the sun, there is what we call the non-natural electromagnetic fields that are in fact produced by technical applications such as power systems. So in the 1900s, when electrif electrification was very, very primitive, you didn't have really 60 hertz or 50 hertz fields around you. And as electrification progressed, uh, people more or less assumed that these fields had no visible uh, or obvious uh, health effects, uh, essentially, because nothing happened instantaneously. But of course, this happens with a lot of agents. In other words, if you're intoxicated with lead, you can be intoxicated with lead for decades before you realize that something is happening. So electrification uh, progressed until at a certain point, people started to examine this and realize that, well, these low frequency fields do have an effect on cells and on part in particular on cancer cells. And more or less the same thing happened with radio frequencies and microwaves. As technology developed, we were able to generate fields of higher and higher frequencies. So what this means is that over time, we have increased the layers of exposures from uh, amplitude AM frequency, like something like uh, five. Uh, 600 uh, kilohertz, then to FM frequencies, which are in the, say, 100 megahertz, to TV frequencies, and then lastly, the last layer that we've added recently is uh, the cell phone uh, signals. So all of these layers probably uh, produced biological impacts that we have gotten used to progressively because this deployment of these new fields is something that happened over time. Uh, what is a bit unusual about the cell phones is that they have known such a rapid deployment. In other words, people acquired cell phones very, very quickly because they were felt to be very, very practical. So in these cases, we have had very uh, sudden rises in certain exposures. And as well, you probably know that with cell phones, the radiation is very different from the TV signals, the FM signals, or the AM signals in the sense that it is compacted into bursts of data, which means that this, uh, this radiation is rather complicated. It has low frequency components in it. So what this means is that in certain types of radiation that we call the technological radiation, we have uh, increased or levels or doses of this by very, very large factors. Some people say by one followed by eight, 18 zeros. So the, the idea that we are somehow resistant to this radiation is something that uh, really needs to be examined very, very critically. So what's, uh, okay, so we're exposed to much faster fluctuation in the fields, electric, yes. magnetic, we're exposed to, uh, and I, I guess that means high frequency when you weren't normally. Uh, we're exposed yeah. to greater amplitude, stronger fields. We're exposed to more kinds of different fields uh, yeah. that have different characters and natures and all that. So what, what kind of yeah. experimentation has been done and what kind of effects have been seen? Well, uh, the, uh, essentially when you're working in a lab, uh, it's fairly simple for you to eliminate these fields and then put them back on and you can see how the cells react. So essentially what we know about biological systems is that they don't have, they don't build resistance to uh, things in their environment that they never encounter. In other words, if you've never encountered an agent before, it's something very, very new to your environment, normally biological organisms are not resistant to them because you don't waste resources in evolution on things that aren't there. So by doing these experiments in which you remove the field and then add them, I personally in my laboratory was able to show that, uh, for example, low frequency magnetic fields, which are contained in power system fields or in cell phone signals, they influence uh, cancer cells of all types. All the major human cancers are influenced in a decisive and clear, clear way 
by this radiation. So if you look at the effects of the radiation, one of the things that it does is that it generates what we call reactive oxygen species, otherwise known as free radicals. Those are molecules or atoms that are very, very active chemically and can uh, it's essentially injure other molecules within living systems. So because of the radiation that we have created in, uh, from technology, we have increased the level of reactive oxygen species in our bodies. And unfortunately, there's a, a, a large number of diseases that develop over time that are sensitive to the level of reactive oxygen species. And uh, there have been observations that are uh, continuing, that are accumulating, that are saying that essentially there are effects on cancer rates. There's effects on reproduction, in other words, the fertility of men and women. There are effects on diseases like diabetes. There's effects on Alzheimer's. There's effects on Parkinson's disease. So all of these things could be inv uh, involved as an effect of electromagnetic field. And these diseases, many of them, have been uh, rising over the last century as we enriched our electromagnetic environment. Well, when you say that EMF has effect on cancer cells, what does that mean? What what effect? Does it affect all cells? For example, so for example, if I, if I, cancer cells? If I uh, take cancer cells uh, that I grow in, uh, in an environment in which there is no, say, uh, ELF radiation, and then I suddenly apply ELF radiation to them, they will change their number of chromosomes. In other words, they will lose chromosomes because their metabolism, their ability to generate energy is being impaired by the, uh, by the exposure. And this is true of all cancers that humans are afflicted by. In other words, your cancer cells are not the same as a result of the, the exposure to this radiation. So, and not the same in the sense that their nuclei in each cell becomes smaller has fewer chromosomes than normal. So what di does this mean? Well, some oncologists would tell you that it might uh, generate some cancer cells that uh, will reproduce faster be because they have fewer chromosomes to copy. And it might generate new types of cancer cells. And perhaps cancer is then more resistant to kill with, uh, with drugs and things like this. It's difficult from an experiment on cells to document what is happening in humans. But then you can turn to experiments on animals to determine what happens. And I don't know if you've heard about the report of the National Toxicology Program that was released this year um, in the United States that was uh, looking at the connection between cell phone signals and cancer in animals. And essentially what the report said is that the uh, signal of cell phones that the industry uh, likes to claim are completely inoffensive actually encouraged uh, the development of cancers in, in the rats and mice. And this result was corroborated, confirmed by another large study in Italy by the Ramazzini Institute. And those were not the first two studies to say that. There were three other large studies previously that all said that essentially exposure to cell phone radiation encourages cancer. So it is a remarkable, I would say, uh, achievement by industry. And uh, 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 you know, it testifies to the popularity of cell phones that in spite of this, these units have become very, very popular among the public because it's very practical to have a communication device with you. So what this means is that the devices that we love uh, bring a problem with them, and possibly there's a way to redesign them to avoid these problems. Well, I don't know if the popularity has anything to do with not caring about the danger, because I don't think most people know or understand that there is any danger. They just like the devices. And I, I, I really have barely heard anything about the dangers of them in a clear way that tells people, hey, there's a big trade-off here with you using them and carrying them, sleeping with them, and pulling them against your head all the time. Well, I, I, I meet very, very few people who haven't heard of this risk. In other words, I meet a taxi driver 
And I say, I work on electromagnetic fields and cell phones, and they tell me usually, oh, yes, the risk of, of cancer associated with that. I think it's a very widespread knowledge that there is discussion. But of course, what industry does is that it likes to push the bar of proof very, very high. What industry does, it says it's under discussion, but we're very uncertain. We're not absolutely uh you know understanding of the mechanism so industry right. is not is not a specialist in health industry is a specialist in making products and making profits so it is in their interest to slow down acknowledgement of the effects and to slow down the development of science so that their product can be unchanged for as long as possible but while this happens uh, of course, uh, people get sick and people can die from uh, from the exposure. Yeah, I totally agree that industry wants to downplay uh, and minimize any possible effects. So knowing what you know, what, what would you advise someone that uh, uses a cell phone? Can they at least mitigate the effects? Well, you know, the, should they wear uh, the, the wired first... earphones versus wireless, et cetera? <clears throat> well, the best thing to use uh, if you're using a cell phone is to use what is called an air tube. This is a small tube that is simply filled with air and brings sound from your cell phone into your ears. And it's as effective as a wired, a conventional wired headset or, or earphone, but because it's a tube filled with air, it brings none of the radiation. So in other words, in doing it like this, uh, well, first thing you wouldn't put the, the cell phone against your, your ear, against your head, because you're microwaving your head. If you must use it, you would use it uh, using uh, an air tube or using the speakerphone, which is also a way to keep it very far away from you. And you could design phones very easily in such a way that they radiate away from people rather than towards people. So there's all sorts of, of good solutions that industry could implement to reduce the exposure of the public. But obviously, industry is in a bit of a quandary. They cannot tell the public that there is no risk and tell their employees at the same time that there is a risk and that they should actually design the cell phones differently or design their software differently. So essentially, within the engineering community, uh, the notion is that probably there is no risk at all. So no precautions at all are taken. So this is the drama in that from a technical point of view, we could do a lot better. But for psychological, legal or liability reasons, nothing is being done until the public asks for it. Well, I mean, cigarettes progressed from, oh, they're totally fine for you, doctors recommended to, you know, now evil. What do you think it's going to take for this progression to happen with uh, electronic devices? Who's going to pay for it? So how will this progression, progression happen to where people understand the dangers, they're clear about it, yes. and the steps are taken to minimize? Well, in a situation in which uh, uh, a powerful industry tries to evade liability for health consequences, it's a rather difficult problem. If you look at their point of view, they are willing to continue exposing the public to excessive uh, levels of radiation as long as they will be allowed to do so. The politicians who are in the business essentially of winning elections don't want to uh, essentially to change situations unless they have to. In other words, politicians are usually not the ones who will take the lead in this. The ones who may be willing to take the lead in this are the lawyers because uh, if, for example, you uh, uh, held your uh, your cell phone in a bra and you get uh, tumors there or you held your cell phone a lot of hours per day against your head and you get brain cancer, you can sue and uh, you could win and you could win a lot of money. And when this happens, because the courts have been sufficiently sensitized to the science, then industry will have to act. <clears throat> but I don't think that industry will act on its own. I don't think that politicians will act on their own. I think that at this point in time, you have to defend yourself against this agent. And until there is a powerful, uh, I would say, uh, 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 lawyers group 
who decides to take on this cause and to make a lot of money from it, it's going to be uh, fairly difficult to change the situation. So if you look at just the cell phone, we'll just take that for now. Yeah. What is the most damaging? Is it the magnetic field? Is it the electric field? Is it the RF? I mean, what is it specifically about it? If you had a Pareto of effects, it would be the, the worst. Okay. Uh, the thing is that what is damaging in the signal of cell phones is not necessarily the high frequency radiation itself. It is the fact that the radiation is being modulated to carry data. And this is a very good technique from the point of view of engineering. It's called time domain multiple access. And there's also frequency domain multiple access, which um, allows the transmission to occur even if you're sitting in a location where the waves don't connect very, very well. But what this means is that many, many times per second, maybe 12 times per second, the intensity of the signal is being changed, the uh, the, uh, the frequency of the signal is being changed, and you're being irradiated by your phone with data bursts maybe 217 times per second. So this structure of what is called the carrier, which brings the signal to the uh, base station, from your phone to the base station, it is this characteristic of this radiation that is in all likelihood the most damaging. However, it's also what makes the, uh, I would say, the commercialization of such systems are advantageous because you have compressed data in a digital way, in such a way that you can pack a lot more conversations on a given bandwidth. So efficiency in terms of data transmission essentially runs uh, in conflict with biological uh, tolerance. In other words, you can't tolerate these good engineering ideas. So we would have to seriously, uh, I would change the, the way in which we use uh, cell phone signals in order to attenuate these effects. So essentially, you could attenuate the sanitary effects of this radiation by a large factors, I would say factors of hundreds, if industry was willing to acknowledge that the effects are there. But the situation that we're living in today is that industry doesn't acknowledge anything, and it simply wants to increase the level of radiation by what is now called 5G, which is uh, another layer of radiation, another layer of frequencies that will probably make the health impacts even worse. So from the point of view of technology, what you should do is that you should uh, place more emphasis on optical fiber. Optical fiber is extremely fast, and use your cell phone more sparingly. In other words, you can still use your cell phone. If you're fortunate enough that your cell phone has been redesigned properly, maybe I can design a cell phone for you that reduces your exposure by a factor of 100. And furthermore, if you develop the habit of downloading your films on your computer and then into your phone, rather than while riding a bus, maybe you can almost eliminate the health effects entirely. So. Um... How, how would you, can you shield a person from their phone or is it just they have to use air tubes and get enough distance or is it in the yes. functioning of the phone itself to reduce the frequency modulation or what could you do? There's a lot of things that you could do in the hardware of the phone. For example, you could design an antenna that radiates away from the head because as the antennas are designed right now, half of the radiation goes into your head, which doesn't make any sense from the practical point of view but that's how they're done. I mean, this is simply the practice of industry. The other thing is that if your phone needs to communicate to send out data, it should wait until it has a good communication with a base station rather than do this randomly or at the moment that you ask it to do so. In other words, there's a lot of changes that are fairly minor that you could implement in cell phones to make them a lot less uh, I would say, aggressive towards human physiology. But before you do this, you have to have an industry that acknowledges that the risks are there. And at the moment, industry simply wants to deny the risks because this is easier than for them to change than changing anything. Well, if you could somehow couple modifying a cell phone's design with longer battery life 
or other beneficial effects that people are looking for, that would probably be the most likely way to get it done. Yes, you're entirely right. For example, if I have an antenna that emits only away from the head, in principle, you can save half of the battery power. But you need to have engineers uh, design this, and you need to do this effectively with the proper bandwidth and the proper transmission ability. That takes a little bit of work. As long as companies can continue to sell the standard cell phones, they will not invest in something like this. Uh, if they want to minimize exposure to people, uh, maybe you could have a cell phone that, for example, will not transmit data when it's directly against your body. You'd have to put it on a table or put it in a, in, in a jacket that's loose fitting so that it would not radiate when it's detecting that you physically will be absorbing a, a lot of this radiation. There's a bunch of tricks well, you know that what, could uh, be used. Yeah. yeah, you know, like when, when I use um, Google Navigation, it gives me that stupid, you know, oh, you're agreeing to the terms and conditions and using it. You could have something like that with the phone where certain activities, a pop-up appears and it says, please make sure you're at least, you know, six inches yeah. away from the phone when doing this activity. And you click OK that you understand that. They could do simple yeah. things like that just for a start, you know? You're entirely right. And th the thing that I favor myself is that the phone should ask you, do you think you should reduce your radiation level? If you think you're willing to tolerate the radiation, your house is full of Wi-Fi, you're surrounded by electronic equipment, and you don't care, the phone can act this way. If, on the other hand, you are electrosensitive, you've heard of that? Those people who can't tolerate it, radiation? Yeah. Yeah. If you're electrosensitive or if you do not want to be exposed to radiation, the phone could give you the choice of warning you and of doing things for you that would reduce your exposure. In other words, you can smoke. It's your risk. It's your choice. I don't want to remove that from anyone. If you are willing to live in bunches of radiation of all sorts and die a little earlier, that's your beef. But you should give the opportunity to people who don't want to be exposed to this agent and who want to be more careful with their health to, uh, to, to do otherwise. And a phone could actually do this for you. So why, I don't know, so it would be a competitive advantage for a phone maker to make a phone that specifically says it minimizes radiation, and, you know, by 80% or 99% or okay. whatever it is. That would be a competitive advantage. Why not do that? At least the model of the phone that does that. I'm going to take you into the corporate boardroom where the engineer that, uh, that has come up with this idea presents the idea to management. And then, of course, the lawyers Wasn't come he the fired? Room. Wasn't he fired <laughs> and gagged? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a difficult position for industry to be in. You have to understand their position. And in my opinion, industry would do it but they need a nudge. They need a push from somewhere, either from an attorney general who decides he's going to sue them or from a powerful politician. Uh, for example, you, you've probably heard Senator Blumenthal ask the, uh, the, the tele telecommunications executives whether they had done any te testing for safety on, on 5G. And they said, no, we have done zero testing on this. So, Senator Blumenthal said, well, so we're flying completely blind here. You are deploying frequencies, you know, throughout uh, the United States and throughout the world. You have no idea what these frequencies are doing to anyone. And they said, no, we, we don't know. So somebody has to push industry in the right direction. What government will do it? What lawyer? What attorney general will do it? We're waiting. Well, um, by creating for instance like i said if we create a phone that says it has you know 99 percent less radiation etc is that also opening all the phone companies up to previous liability from other phones that they've made before and all the other companies that yeah. could have liability because yeah. of that yes you know the united states it is a country that favors uh letting companies put on the market what they want but there is a correct correction that can happen at some time if you've been uh, spewing lead everywhere, ultimately, uh, you can be sued. And in the United States, it's often the way it works. We let problems develop. We let problems flourish. And the correction 
is one that happens in the courts when there is sufficient evidence at a certain moment uh, there are uh, lawsuits that are extremely expensive and government starts reacting, people start reacting, companies go out of business, and a lot of uh, consequences follow. But frankly, my job is to convince you to act because before it goes that way, there is no reason for us to go through this scenario of people dying and lawyers making a lot of money and companies going bankrupt if we can, through better engineering, improve our situation. Couldn't there be a safe harbor made, you know, uh, where I guess the EA would have to come from the government where they would say, all right, we want you to develop technology that's safer for people to use in, in terms of, let's say, cell phones, you know, computers, et cetera. We're going to give you a safe harbor on those devices and, you know, liability, but we'll be stopped for previous stuff so long as you commit to uh, a development of future products that have meet these standards. Yes, I think that it's it's a remarkable idea, but you would need somebody uh, who would be willing to invest a lot of time in bringing industry together with uh, legislators and so on. And maybe we haven't found uh, this person yet. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, you have a seat belt on your car, but at a certain point when the idea of a seat belt was introduced uh, by people or was suggested by people, General Motors' reaction, I love their cars, I have a GM car myself, but GM's reaction was that, you know, it's not cars that make accidents, it's people that make accidents. They said, it's none of our business. The responsibility is with the driver. Then another company in Sweden, Volvo, had a different attitude. They said, well, maybe accidents happen, but we as a manufacturer share in that responsibility if we have unsafe cars. And seat belts were introduced, and now you can use a seat belt in your car, and you can be protected from dire consequences. So essentially, it's the same thing here. There, you need to have a ch to have a change of attitude by industry to improve situation. So, um, what are some resources for people so they can start to get some kind of clear idea on what the effects of their particular exposure pattern might be by device, by how they use it, etc. Uh, by device, you mean, uh, 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 you know, items other than cell phones? Well, here, here's an example. So you're telling me this info, and let's say I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about my health. I want to do something about it. So we, we kind of answered this a little bit, but let's say I use AirPods with my Android phone. I don't put it to my head, but I use AirPods. What can I do to mitigate yeah. my risk? Should I use, like, the AirTube headphones and speakerphone? Is that enough? Should I, uh, you know, when I go to sleep at night, put it on airplane mode? Um, you know, what if I'm using a laptop at work? What if um, there's Wi-Fi at my workplace and I'm using a laptop and I'm using, you know, how do people, since the cell phone companies won't take action, politicians so far yeah. haven't taken action, it's up to the individual. Yeah. So what's, where is there a guide for them on what to do to mitigate their exposure? Well, any engineer can tell you more or less what to do. <clears throat> For example, there's a company called Swisscom. It's a, a, a national company of Switzerland who uh, filed a patent so that they would have a protocol for cellular phones that would reduce the exposure. But the patent was never implemented in the end. There's lots of things that can be done. As you point out, for example... If Wi-Fi is not being used, why is it still on? Because while it's not being used, it's still looking for contacts, for communications, for handshakings. You could design very easily systems that, that turn off when they're not being used. And this is something that is an elementary precaution. And the reason why we don't have them is that engineers were told that it was absolutely uh, immaterial. There are some wireless phones. Those are not cell phones. Those are the phones you would use inside your home. These stations, the base stations, emit radiation all the time, even when the phone is on the, is on the receptacle and not being used at all. Those are all basic design flaws from a group of people who were told that this is immaterial. It doesn't matter. This radiation doesn't do anything. So this amounts to a type of religion that was propagated within the engineering community. 
and that the engineering community needs to shed itself of. So engineers who design hardware can contribute, engineers who design software can contribute, and these changes would not increase the price of the equipment and would essentially protect our health. Okay, I understand. So what's, uh, in terms of your particular research, are there other things that we've talked about that you haven't discussed yet? You know, any surprising insights or nuances that uh, you think are important to talk about? Uh, I think that uh, a lot of researchers have been looking for what I would call um, uh, a magic bullet. They are thinking maybe there is some sort of radiation that we can find that will have no effect on the body whatsoever. Can we uh, figure out a way to do this without any risk? I really believe that biology is fairly complicated. Telecommunications on its side has its own complexities. I think that the best way is to reduce the electromagnetic environment. Of course, we we want to have access to as much data as we as we wish, and that's not very very hard to do because we have uh, techniques for data transmission like optical fiber that are uh, 10 million times faster ultimately than 5G is. So wireless will always be a very feeble link for data compared to optical fiber in, in particular. And it's just approximately at the same level as a, as a good cable. So we should invest more in optical fiber uh, network development. This is what the telcos use for themselves. They're just selling you the last link wirelessly because they think it's more convenient to you. But you should go into the habit of using mostly optical fiber data transmission and use wireless with improved cell phones and use it when you really need it. Don't depend and don't go around your life, your nose stuck to a cell phone just because it's bright. In fact, cell phones have all sorts of other inconveniences that you would call sociological inconveniences. In some, in some provinces of China, they outlaw law them in schools completely because children are going myopic. So cell phones are okay. Cell phones are great, but they should be redesigned, and we shouldn't try to live our lives uh, while irradiated by them continuously. Do you know of anyone that has designed things that could be added to a cell phone to shield it from the user? Or unfortunately, does that not work and you have to... Yes. Uh, unfortunately, most of these devices that you find on the market that claim that they will reduce your radiation, many of these devices are ideas that I would say are last-minute ideas of people who want to capitalize on the fear that some people have of, ra of radiation. So uh, for best results by far, the thing to do is to alter the structure of the antennas themselves and alter the software in the phones themselves. That will give you huge gains compared to any after-the-fact addition, although an air tube is very effective. Very good. So what's the best way for people to find out more and uh, look at the work that you've done and get in contact? Well, I have my own website called invitroplus.megill.ca. That's invitro, I-N-V-I-T-R-O, plus.megill.ca. There's a, a book there on uh, that is free to download on health effects of electromagnetism. There is the Environmental Health Trust that also has a website that is very, very complete about health effects of electromagnetic radiation. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Paul, thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. All right. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, 
cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Thank you.